fiery furnaces, lunar landscapes, deserts of ashes. Volcanoes are symbols of destruction and desolation. There are many ways in which volcanoes constitute a threat to life. And yet, in the four corners of the Earth, 500 million men and women are today living on time bombs. What irresistible force attracts them to these terrible giants of fire? Across the course of human history, volcanoes have given humanity far more than they've taken away. For human societies, volcanoes are an inexhaustible wealth of resources. Mm, that's delicious, firm and fragrant. Fertile lands, precious materials, sources of heat and energy. And if you live in a place where the soils are exceptionally fertile, you're going to stay in that place. But the treasures of volcanoes must be earned. Only armed with courage and unshakable selflessness can we hope to conquer them. In Tanzania, the old Duanyo Lengai volcano towers above a unique lake, Lake Natron. Steeped in chemicals of volcanic origin, its waters are unfit for human consumption, but they hide a quite different treasure. As they dry, the shores of the lake reveal large patches of salt. This salt is an invaluable resource for the region's inhabitants. During the six months of the dry season, the Maasai women come here daily to collect large slabs of the precious mineral. Among them is Anna. Armed with a simple machete, she tirelessly combs vast stretches of lakeshore in search of the best slabs of salt. It's a sound that footsteps make and the light-colored soil that tell you there's something salty inside. Lengai lava is unique. Rich in sodium, it is black when it emerges from the volcano's mouth and becomes white on contact with the air. Old Onya Lengai erupts. Materials in themselves are made of sodium carbonate that eventually finds its way into Lake Natron. Lake Natron is an extraordinary lake. The water is alkaline, feels very soapy, and the lake develops a crust of what they call trona, sodium hydrogen carbonate. So from a distance, Lake Natron looks quite remarkable. It's a, a bright white body where you have a, a crust of a particular mineral which is formed on top of this alkaline lake. I do this work to feed my children. You cannot survive without working hard. You have to work hard, even if you cut your fingers and sweat a lot. We give the salt to our cows, we sell it, we use all its benefits. If someone has a stomach ache, they must drink it mixed in a glass of water. We gather the salt, wait for it to dry, and load up the mules to take it home. 
When it's market day, it's a chance for us to sell it. We sell salt for the money, not just for feeding our children, but also for things like buying goats, paying for our children's schooling, helping sick people to pay for the hospital, or for clothes, for heating, and feeding a baby like this one so she doesn't go hungry. People live around volcanoes largely because of the things that they give much more than the things that they take away. And often volcanoes erupt periodically, and then for much of the time, it's a great place. So people can move away while the volcano um, is at its most dangerous. But after all, the place where they live is their home. We have forgotten what it is like to be a subsistence dweller, to, to be a person that wakes up every morning with the challenge of feeding his or her family from the immediate environment. In Indonesia, Kawa Ijen contains another mineral treasure in its smoking crater lake, sulfur. So the lake is what Ijen is famous for, and they have a lot of sulfur and chlorine uh, and, uh, and other constituents that give the lake its particular chemistry. The other thing that it's well known for is the mining of sulfur by uh, members of the local community. The, um, the sulfur gases uh, can, uh, can, can react to form liquid sulfur. At dawn, armed with shoulder baskets, hundreds descend into the bowels of the volcano. Here, they are known as the strongmen of Java a source of both revenue and prestige. The manual extraction of sulfur is a highly prized activity. Sano is a seasoned miner who, despite the extreme harshness of the work, takes great pride in his job. There is nothing better than this tool. This one's a good one. He has spent his whole life in this volcanic hell. I've worked here for 28 years without a helmet or gloves. I've never had a problem. I'm used to it. What's dangerous is the smoke coming from the lake. This one is not dangerous. The one from the lake is dangerous. Round shapes on the surface is a sign. The water starts to bubble and smoke immediately comes out. Once they've collected the sulfur, they, they carry a phenomenal weight of it back up this steep path out of the crater and then some way down the flank of the volcano. And that combined effort, I think, of the um, being in, this, in these gases and carrying such heavy weights, it's very, very, very hard on the body. I've tried lifting up one of these uh, crates before I could barely lift the thing, so I, I, I don't know how they do it. I can carry up to 75 kilos on my shoulders. So if I do two trips a day, I carry 150 kilos.
Sarno's sulfur harvest earns him on average 80 euros per month, double the average income in the region. Fifty-two kilos. <laughs> Sulfur is bought from the miner, then transformed. A key ingredient for sugar bleaching, cosmetics manufacturing, and fertilizer research. It's one of the cornerstones of the local economy. To the southeast of Java lies another volcano that feeds the communities at its feet. From atop its 2,329 meters, Mount Bromo regularly spews out huge plumes of ashes, covering the region with a thick gray coat. Yet, it takes just a few years for this volcanic ash to break down and feed the soils of all the precious minerals it contains. Volcanoes can be very beneficial places to live because they erupt material that's very easily weathered, that releases nutrients. And so very quickly after a volcanic eruption, the system can re-establish and the volcanic ecosystem can be vibrant. From a grey, arid desert, the region is transformed into an oasis of greenery, constantly cultivated by its inhabitants. The rural village of Simaro Lawang is located less than three kilometers from Bromo's smoking mouth. At Soko, a young farmer takes full advantage of the fertility of the mountain, of ash and fire. Here we have two types of land, one that is grey, almost white, and the land here, which is black. Every five years, sometimes ten years, we have eruptions. Bromo brings us fertilizer. The land is renewed, otherwise the harvest will not be good. It's so fertile here that many things grow, such as potatoes, sweet potatoes, leeks, peppers, corn. It suits all plants. No soil in the world is more spontaneously fertile than volcanic soil. The volcanic soil from the degradation, the decomposition of lava, is the only one that is spontaneously quite fertile, because lava contains all the mineral elements that the plant needs to grow. So, logically, man notices that, and logically, he exploits it. Daikon only grows on Sakurajima. It's the world's biggest radish, and it's found nowhere else. It weighs around six kilos. Located south of Kushu Island, Sakurajima is one of the most active volcanoes in Japan. Its explosive activity makes it one of the country's most dangerous, in the case of a major eruption. But these daily eruptions, far from representing a danger, are a real blessing for the region's farmers. One of the most dramatic manifestations of, of the fertility of volcanic soil comes from Sakurajima. On the plains around Sakurajima, which are coated with volcanic ash very frequently, people are able to grow radishes to enormous size, turnips, and it's 
just fascinating to think about what it is that is in the soil that allows these vegetables to grow in such an extraordinary way. Volcanic ash adds minerals into the soil which can uh, increase crop yields in some cases. Uh, volcanic ash also adds in particles of different sizes to the soil and that can increase the productivity through improved drainage of the soils. I've got used to talking to my daikons as if they were my children. But when I take care of them, I encourage them to grow. I tell them, go ahead, grow well, as I plant them. If the daikon is big, I am very happy. Uh, if it is smaller, my happiness is cut in half. I am not a volcano specialist, but Sakurajima is close to us and its presence is like a family. Uh, like my ancestors, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my parents. Yes, because the biggest radishes in the world grow at the foot of Sakurajima. In 1999, the volcano Tungurahua erupted, releasing an avalanche of incandescent ash that destroyed everything in its path. Overnight, the inhabitants of the little village of Paliktahua, located just a few kilometers from the volcano, lost their houses and their lands. But armed with boundless resolve and courage, the community has returned to these volcanic ash-nourished lands and organized itself to work them collectively. The volcano has united the men who drew strength from this ordeal to build a common future together. This land is very good, very productive. The whole community sows together. Then everyone profits from the sale. They all encouraged us to go on working and organize these community fields. The community is a group of human beings. We are several families in the village. We have uh, done quite a bit of research on Tungrawa in Ecuador, and um, what we found there is that over time, the volcanic ash has actually caused the farmers to change how they're farming. What that's meant is that the, the farmers who live around the volcano have adapted their practice in order to be able to respond to the activity of the volcano and to mitigate some of the impacts of the ash. People who live near volcano make changes in order to maintain their livelihood. In order to be able to stay living near the volcano. In the shadow of Tungurahua, the region's inhabitants have joined forces to revive the local economy.
Every week, the community sells its products at the Rio Bamba market. Every Saturday, our family comes to the market to sell our products. This year, we planted 80% of our land. And the soil is so productive, how can we not be satisfied? This represents almost 40 hectares. That is a very large farm. We produce beans, potatoes, corn, so that we can continue to feed the population in the event of an eruption. Tungura Ua has always been here. We call it Mother Tungura Ua, or Grandmother Tungura Ua. Personally, I believe it is our friend, because thanks to him, 200 of us in the community have come together. But for the volcano, everyone would work for themselves. We should be grateful to him. In Iceland, the fertility of the Vestman Islands has enabled the growth of an activity rarely encountered on such small volcanic islets, pastoralism. The archipelago of the Vestman Islands is composed of 14 islands that were raised from the sea by underwater eruptions. Each of these islands represents an opportunity for the men in this region of the world where fertile lands are so rare. In many parts of the world, you have uh, stories about volcanoes and volcanic eruptions that have involved the creation of new land, particularly of new islands. And land, of course, in any culture, is important, okay? To own land um, is really to have power. Um, and it's not just the ownership of land, but it's also the productive uh, uh, potential of that land as well. An eruption of phenomenal violence is at the origin of this unprecedented form of transhumance. In 1973, a volcano appeared right in the middle of Jaime the only inhabited island of the archipelago. Lava fountains and flows threatened to sweep away the island's little fishing village, and the whole population was evacuated. But that disaster also triggered a miracle. The huge quantity of ash spewed out by the eruption spread all over the archipelago covering the Vestman Islands with this incredible volcanic fertilizer. Today, these islands are covered with a rich, luxuriant grass, an exceptional pasture for sheep. Each year, Biani takes his flocks in an extraordinary transhumance, an island transhumance. I have lived here since I was very young in this archipelago, and I always saw sheep brought here. They spend the winter here in good conditions, sheltered. Uh, we kept up the tradition. I think, given the current situation, that it's better here in the islands than it is in southern Iceland. But to reach these green pastures requires a tailor-made logistics operation. We'll need to use a lifting arm because the sea is bad in the east. Yeah. 
Nei. Og nei, her er det jo hytt igjen da. Ja. Ordentlig hyrvis. Nei, ja. On these volcanic islands with cliffs eaten away by the erosion, there is no pier. The flock is hoisted onto dry land using a winch to a height of more than 20 meters. For nearly three months, these sheep will graze peacefully on this dormant volcano. The exceptional grass on this volcanic land gives their flesh a unique taste. In Hawaii, Mauna Loa is the largest volcano on the planet. Layer after layer, the lava flows have built a colossus of basalt. For tens of kilometers, the island of Hawaii exhibits its windswept lava fields. Only a few ferns and shrubs can withstand these harsh conditions. Here, life has taken root thanks to the hand of man. In the crevices of the volcano, an inhabitant has found refuge and a perfect place for growing. John Wilson protects his banana trees from the wind in the folds of Mauna Loa. I came here because of the caves and the volcano. Apuka is a Hawaiian word for hole in the ground. And everyone knows that bananas do not do very well in high wind. So I said, I've got this puka. I will just put the farm down in there where it's protected from the wind. Then uh, hopefully produce many, many years of good bananas. Well, the hole was already here, but the rocks were scattered about at random. And so we relocated the rocks so that they would form terraces. And then I brought in brown cinder, and then we mixed it with all the vegetation we could find, branches, leaves, cardboard, any organic material, mixed it all together and spread it out in the bottom of the puka. We're taking what might take nature hundreds of years to do, or longer. Uh, we're getting that down into five years. I think volcanoes hold a special place uh, for communities who live around volcanoes because volcanoes are a seeable thing in the natural environment and often those mountainous environments offer a place of sanctuary or somewhere very special and um, beautiful. Many people say that volcanoes are very dangerous and so why do people still live on them? Um, I think the answer to that is that the people who live on them don't really consider those volcanoes very dangerous, or at least they consider that the quality of life that they could have by living on a volcano is really worth the, the, the possible uh, threat from that volcano. I think this volcano is not only a good thing for me, but something I really appreciate and I like. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that volcano. It, the, the volcano and what it does and what it has done over thousands or millions of years is what makes this area what I like. And I can look around in the caves, on the surface, and I can see just 
a tremendous number of aesthetically pleasing rock shapes and other features. So uh, the volcano for me is a very positive thing. Across the course of human history, volcanoes have given humanity far more than they've taken away because they give you wonderful materials. So you go to almost any volcanic area and the city nearby is built from the volcano. The stone that builds the, the, uh, the buildings and streets are from the volcano. Thanks to volcanoes, man has erected his finest monuments. In Auvergne, Lava stone made a fortune for these volcanic territories. The monuments of Auvergne seem literally carved out of basalt. The Saint Michel de Guy church stands proudly atop a volcanic chimney. and Clermont-Ferrand proudly displays its black cathedral built from the legendary Volvic stone. Its dark color has earned the monument its nickname, the Coleman's Cathedral. Thanks to the lava stone, man has gone closer to the stars, building ever higher monuments. But by digging in the basement of these volcanic lands, he has also begotten a mysterious underground world. The city of Naples grew up in the shadow of Vesuvius, one of the most active volcanoes in Europe. And though it regularly threatened the city with its wrath, Naples wouldn't be the Naples we know today without its venerable neighbor. Some 14,000 years ago, a cataclysmic eruption covered the whole of the region with a layer of volcanic material, yellow tuff. This stone with unique properties was extracted from its basements to build the city of Naples. At 40 meters underground, there's another Naples, a mirror image. Vincenzo Albertini is a geologist. For years, he's been studying this underground network dug into the volcanic rock. Its first tunnels date back to antiquity. We entered here in the heart of the Greco-Roman aqueduct. It's the single greatest hydraulic work carried out by the Romans in the imperial era. Just think, a tiny slope that allowed the water to travel kilometers and kilometers before reaching the city of Naples some 80 kilometers further on. We are in one of the 14,000 tanks. Imagine that above us is a building. From this building, you had to send down an amphora or a recipient of the period. And even after the fall of the Roman Empire, that continued to work in the same way. Just send down a container, collect the water, haul it up to your home. As a result, every building had its own tank. The stone here is the same as the one we find up there. Everything that's missing here has been used to build up above. An inverted city, a Naples, two-thirds of which has an empty basement because the stone has been used to give shape to the buildings which are on the surface. Some volcanoes erupt material that is much less dense than basalt. It, this makes a fantastic building stone because it is, it is light and strong but it's also quite easy to carve out. So many locations in Naples 
are built out of these sorts of volcanic tufts. Today, other properties of tuff are being put to the test in Naples' underground network. Its ability to maintain a constant temperature and humidity. A boon that Neapolitans have put to good use, growing another symbol of the city, basil. Mmm, mm, that's delicious. Firm and fragrant. The turf is a good thermal conductor, so it allows for good insulation with a temperature that remains, in summer as in winter, almost always the same, between 14 and 16 degrees. This basil is grown in an absence of pollution, of course, as it grows underground. Naples has been lucky to have all these volcanoes. So many volcanoes mean a lot of life, a lot of work and a bright future. Still in Italy, there's another mythical volcano which spreads its benefits to a whole region. In summer, Sicily is a hot, arid territory, swept by dry winds from the Sahara. The island regularly suffers from serious water shortages. And yet, around its volcano, Etna, vegetation and crops flourish and cover the region with a thick green mantle. Volcanoes create microclimates by changing the atmospheric conditions around them. And the presence of the volcano itself changes the wind patterns and the airflow around the volcano, uh, and that can locally change the meteorology as well. It's a very high mountain and it kind of creates its own weather, creates its own climate. You often find that in the morning the cloud builds up and then it envelops the summit. You, you don't see the, the volcano in the afternoon and of course all that moisture starts to fall into the volcano and as it then moves through. Boris Benke is a volcanologist. Perched at more than 3,300 meters in altitude, he tirelessly travels the active summit of Etna to understand how it works. He sees Etna as a natural water tower. If the mountain wasn't here, the volcano wasn't here. Here, the land was low, relatively flat, it was warm and dry. It would be very different without this volcano, which is extremely valuable, because Sicily is normally a very dry place. So that's probably one of the reasons why there has been so much population around the volcano for so long, especially in the sector where there are the most springs because there's a lot of precipitation. There's snow that will fall during the spring. There are lots of storms, rain on the mountain. As we can see, this rock is pretty dense, but it is porous. There are a lot of fractures, so the water disappears into the mountain. There's no river, no stream. It all goes into the mountain, which acts like a sponge. It's a huge water table. This water circulating in Etna, filtered by porous volcanic rocks, flows into the valley in the form of an infinity of small springs. The island of Sicily is in the Mediterranean. It gets very hot in the summer, but nonetheless, the flanks of Mount Etna are, offer perfect arable land. That means that even in places that are, that are typically barren and lack water, the volcanoes themselves can actually be repositories of water. 
if you're in a, in a desertic region uh, and, and trying to eke out a living, a volcano is, is the, the natural place to, to live because um, the volcano attracts some cloud and some rain and you can collect some water. For the Sicilians, Etna's water is a blessing. They call their volcano La Mama. Thanks to this beneficent force, they grow oranges with a flavor that is unique. And when the water meets the volcano's heat, there's another treasure trove. When you have a volcano with sources of water around it, those volcanoes will often show what we call geothermal activity. So there might be vents of steam, pools of hot water, uh, fractures releasing um, gases to the surface. The geothermal energy results from the fact that the crust contains water, and that water gets heated up by the hot magma which is stored underneath the volcano. And we can exploit that geothermal energy. In Japan, the monkeys of the volcanic zone of Jigo Kudani take advantage of the hot springs to combat the harsh winter. These thermal springs, whose temperature can rise to 60 degrees, are a real refuge for the monkeys, who dive in with delight as soon as the outside temperature drops below 5 degrees. But in this country, that has the highest concentration of hot springs in the world, men also benefit from this volcanic heat. At the foot of Sakurajima, the heat of the depths, expelled to the surface by volcanic activity, is the subject of many applications, some of which are surprising. The Ibusuki thermal springs have existed for 300 years. The sand here weighs between 50 and 60 kilos, and its temperature is kept between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Lying on your back is naturally good for the circulation. The amount of blood sent from the heart, known as cardiac output, goes up when people lie on the hot, wet sand because their blood vessels are dilated. Sand baths help the circulation. They also have a detoxifying effect, which is in fact very fashionable nowadays. People have used geothermal waters and, and kind of gases for millennia to do all sorts of things. There are huge belief systems around it, they're really special sites, but ordinary things. People use the geothermal energy directly, they use hot water from the groundwater system directly, they may use that for heating, for bathing, they might use that for cooking as well. Geothermal energy is one of the benefits of living near a volcano. On the highlands of Iceland, a real kingdom of volcanoes, men have long since learned to exploit the heat from the depths. A chef has taken advantage of the intense volcanic activity in his country. By channeling the vapors that emerge all over his village, he has developed a very local cooking technique, volcanic cuisine. 
we are using this power here to uh, cook with. Okay. And we have learned to use it to bake cake and cut out wow. and cut out cake and everything. And also we are making nice bread. And over here we are doing very nice potatoes. Wow. Yeah. So if you try this carrot here, it's a different taste. Really? Yeah, different taste. The way this came about was great. It came to me in a dream. I awoke at 4 a.m. and had dreamed about cooking and how I had to put all of this to good use. I went out and started building, and my wife said to me, you've totally lost the plot. Take a pill and come back to bed. So we are making a lamb goulash. In this unusual kitchen, Everything now uses geothermal energy. We have the pressure at 14 kilobar in the pan here, and we have steam at 170 degrees centigrade. So it is really very hot. That helps us cook with all these pans. This oven used to be a 34 kilowatt electric oven that used a lot of energy. The meter could be used as a tumble dryer, it turned so fast. We changed the connections, removed all the electrical equipment, installed an old plumbing tap, put a pipe inside, and made a spiral. Now it works wonderfully well. Bon appétit! <laughs> We can say that cooking in this environment connects us with nature, with the wild. It's like living with danger in a way. Being aware of it and respecting it, this allows us to use the energy that comes from the bowels of the earth. Beyond local use, the heat from volcanoes carries infinite potential. One of the major challenges of our post-industrial society is that of energy transition. If we're only able to capture even a small amount of that heat energy and convert it into useful energy, energy we can use, then it can make a tremendous effect. Increasingly, as the planet tries to think of different energy sources, geothermal will become a really important one. For heat, first of all, but increasingly in very particular places for, for power generation, for electricity. The huge Wairake power station draws from the depths the geothermic heat produced by the volcanoes. Wairake is the largest geothermal field in New Zealand, an area of 25 square kilometers. It is located in the Taupo volcanic zone and fed by the volcano's magma chamber. Greg Bignall is a geologist. He puts his knowledge at the service of this new energy revolution. The largest of those geothermal systems is the Wairake geothermal field. That generates about 157 megawatts. So that's comparable to about 160,000 homes of electricity being generated. Geothermal energy is a resource uh, deep beneath our, our feet. The, the process starts uh, many thousands of years ago with rain falling on the, the, the hills to the east and the west of the, the Taupo Volcanic Zone. That water slowly percolates through the earth via cracks and, and fissures in the rock uh, to reach some depth within the central volcanic zone uh, where magma sits in the near surface and starts to, to heat that, that water. Right now, New Zealand's geothermic activity supplies around 20% of its electricity. But that figure is constantly growing. 
Volcanoes are now an asset in one of the greatest challenges man has ever had to face and can offer a new energy destiny to entire nations. Geothermal energy is, is starting to be really popular because it's clean, it doesn't produce CO2 to go to the atmosphere, and it, certainly on a geological uh, scale, it's renewable. You know, the heat is always coming out. Geothermal activity is, is one of the key sources of renewable energy for the future. I would love to see it used more widely than it is. Um, it's, it's fairly easy, it's fairly straightforward, and, uh, um, and, and it's there, and it's free. Men have found refuge in the shadow of volcanoes. Far from their destructive image, these living mountains are veritable oases, inexhaustible sources of wealth. They give more than they take away. But also there's something about the volcano. It has an identity. I think people are drawn to that. So these are the most incredible landscapes to live in. And I think if I was going to retire and go somewhere, I'd probably go and live on a volcano. <laughs>